Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you much, so much to the Ellen Coolidge Burke Library. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and if you guys can just wave uh, when I say your name, that would be great. So alphabetically, we have Donna Andrews. Donna was born in Yorktown, Virginia, and lives in Reston, Virginia. She writes the Agatha and Anthony winning Meg Langslow series. Murder with Peacocks, the first in the series, came out in 1999. And the most recently published novel is The Twelve Jays of Christmas, which is the 30th in the series. She also published Murder Most Foul earlier this year. In addition to the Meg Langslow mysteries, she's also written the Turing Hopper series and more than a dozen short stories. Next, we have Barb Goffman. Barb is a dedicated short story writer. She's been a finalist 33 times for major crime writing awards. This year, she won the Agatha Award and the Reader's Award given by Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine for her story, Dear Emily Etiquette. In prior years, she's won the, the Agatha, McCavity, and Silver Falchion Awards. One of the stories she's had published this year, her favorite, is A Tale of Two Sisters in the anthology Murder on the Beach, through which she got to show off her funny side. She earns her living as a freelance crime fiction editor specializing in cozy and traditional mysteries. Tara Leskowski's debut suspense novel, One Night Gone, won the Agatha Award, McCavity Award, and the Anthony Award. Her second standalone suspense novel, The Mother Next Door, was published this October. She also wrote two short story collections, Modern Manners for Your Inner Demons and Bystanders. She has won the Agatha Award and Thriller Award for her short fiction and was the longtime editor of the online flash fiction journal, Smoke Long Quarterly. A graduate of Susquehanna University and George Mason University, Tara grew up in Pennsylvania and now lives in Virginia. I'm Kathy Wiley, and I'm a member of Sisters in Crime, Mystery Writers of America, and the Short Mystery Fiction Society. I've had several short stories included in anthologies, one of which was a 2015 finalist for a Derringer Award, and I'm currently working on the Food Festival Fatality series about a former celebrity chef who is trying to rebuild her career by judging at food festivals. I live outside of Baltimore, Maryland, with one spoiled cat and an equally spoiled husband. All of us are members of the Chesapeake chapter of Sisters in Crime. Sisters in Crime is, is an organization that was founded in 1986 to work towards having female authors treated as the equals of male writers. Now we are working towards equity and inclusion for all voices in the mystery world. We welcome anyone who supports equality. I will be asking the panelists a series of questions, but we would love to get um, any feedback, any questions, anything from the uh, audience. We definitely love to hear from you guys. So please feel free to put anything in the chat and I will address it either at the end or if it fits during the question session. So I'm gonna start. Um, so we have Donna representing series, Tara is representing standalones and Barb is representing short stories. I'd like the authors to discuss how they got into this type of writing, especially whether it was a deliberate choice or did you just end up there? Um, I will start first with, with Donna. Bless you, Donna. Thank you, that, that's a cough, not a sneeze. Ah. <coughs> I have been doing both lately. No, it's only a cold, only a cold. Uh, yeah, I do series. I actually, <coughs> when I first started writing just because, <coughs> And this didn't decide to happen until you called on me, right? Of course. It's like magic. <clears throat> I began writing a mystery series because that's kind of what I mostly read at the time I started writing. Uh, I've always been very fond of a series. I could, I won't name them because I don't want to call them out, but <clears throat> I can think of a couple of writers that I still hold grudges about the fact that they wrote standalones that I think ought to have been series. Uh, I actually started out writing short stories when I was when I was in college uh, because that's what you wrote for writing class. But uh, even in college, I started I had a wrote a couple of I wrote a short story <coughs> and then wrote a related short story and then realized that I if I wrote a few more, it would be a novel. And so I actually started writing a novel in, in my first writing class. So even though they they do try to steer you to writing short stories because it's a lot easier in a teaching situation to see if someone has a grasp of the concepts when they, you can judge a whole work in an hour rather than a couple of days. 
but um, I, I got into books and I guess I'm verbose. Once I get started writing about characters, it's kind of hard to stop me. So I'm a natural as a novelist and as a series novelist, because I can always think of more stuff they could get up to. Great, great. All right, Tara, how about you? Um, I feel like I'm kind of the opposite of Donna here because I am way more on the like short end of things. In fact, I feel like I should almost be <laughs> in the short story um, ring here, but I started out writing short fiction and for a long time, I was editor of Smoke Long Quarterly, which is a flash fiction publication, which was stories that were a thousand words or less. Uh, and so I've always felt like I was a short story writer before anything else. Um, so I guess the answer to your question, Kathy, is I kind of fell into this. Um, I didn't ever really think of myself as a novelist and I wasn't sure if I could ever write a novel because I was always just so interested in the short fiction form, I guess. Um, but I, I guess because, I mean, I tried to write a novel, but I, I just can't see doing a series. I, and I, I'm not gonna say that I'll never do one, but I just, because I am so into like the short form, the idea of carrying on like multiple books with the same people, like kind of scares me a little bit. <laughs> because I just feel like I would uh, get sick of them or like, you know, have all I, I, I don't know. I'd say all I wanted to say, and then I'd be done, and I wouldn't know how to continue it. So I don't know. I guess I'm in the middle here between these two forms for a reason. So yeah, yeah. Um, and Barb, um, I actually started out writing a novel. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote first. I think it was eleven or twelve chapters, and I got stuck. I, I write very linearly. So I, I got stuck, I needed to speak to an expert and the contact I made wasn't available for a few weeks. Then I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. So I started writing another book and I finished that one. Um, and then I was about to start querying and I got a new job and then I got really busy. And I didn't have any time to work on that. But then my Sisters in Crime chapter um, put out a call for short stories. And um, I thought, well, I might have time for that, so couldn't hurt to try. And it turned out I really liked the form and I never left. So, so Barb, what, what uh, anthology was that? That was Chesapeake Crimes 2. Two, okay, great. I did not Which is an anthology, anthology that now Barb and, and Marsha Talley and I uh, work on an anthology every two years that's only open to chapter members and it, it's designed to feature the chapter and uh, benefit the chapter. So Barb, were they themed back then or was it just a call for any kind of short story? Uh, it should, for, yeah, for the first three, they, no, I take it back. For the first two, they were just short stories. Mm -hmm. um, the third one, they wanted anything in the Chesapeake region. And then starting with book four, they had a theme like, you know. Yeah. We hate men. I'm sorry. We we, we do we love men. That, I was just making a joke. Go on. Never mind. But yes, that really wasn't like, a thing. This job is go. murder or yes, that was a thing. Fur feathers and felonies or uh, homicidal holidays. Yep. I kind of like the idea of having a theme for the short stories because it's it's like a writing prompt. Uh, if you tell me write a short story, I'm like, hey. but like I write a short story about this. It's like I might kick against the idea but it gives me a focus you know yeah like right now we have a, a we have a, a call it's just for short stories it has to be something about sports okay i can work with that although there's questions about what the definition of a sport is we we have had uh, some some legal discussions about that but mm -mm. So you guys have somewhat already answered this when you were talking about what uh, whether it was a choice, but what attracts you to that particular type type of storytelling that you have somewhat chosen? Um, I'll start with Tara on this question. Um, <clears throat> so I like a standalone, say, versus a series um, because I like to create new worlds um, every time. And I recognize that that makes it more of a challenge because I think one of the great things about a series is that once you've established a world and you've established these characters, 
it's like, I don't want to say it's easier, but it's, but that's like one thing you just don't necessarily have to invent every time. And, um, and because readers fall in love with those characters and that place, and they get very excited to read more about that. But on the other hand, it's hard to make things keep happening for these people and for like big events that would warrant, you know, a crime being solved or whatever. Um, my husband and I are like working our way through all of the murder she wrote right now. And, you know, it's like, it's so ridiculous after like season two or three that every week she finds a new murdered person. Like her friends must hate her because every time she shows up somewhere, someone dies. Yeah. Um, and so you, you have to like, obviously that has to be just like, you have to take that with a grain of salt. But for me, it's like, I like creating these new worlds. I like um, making bad things happen to people, but then being done with that. Like, I don't have to worry about, you know, ending it on a place where I have to continue or something. So I think that's kind of why I like it. And that's why I like short fiction as well. So I guess it's, it's just kind of an extension of, of that in some ways. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Barb? Um, well, God, a long time ago now, I guess in the mid nineties, that feels like yesterday, but it was a long time. I was a newspaper reporter and I, I'm trained to write short. So short stories was a, really a natural fit for me. Uh, lately, my short stories have been getting longer. I mean, I, 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 I'm all over the place now. I had flash fiction published this past year, but I also had a story. Hi, sweetheart. Sorry, dog visiting. Um, I had a short story that came out this early, earlier this year that was um, 12,000 words long, which for people who write novels is probably like, oh, that's nothing. But for me, that was really long. That was um, 40 some odd pages. So I felt like... You know, you can really say so much more with 40 or 50 pages than you can with 10. And I have, that has nothing to do with what you asked me, so I'll stop talking. No, you're, you're fine. You, um, Donna, how about you? What attracted you to series? Well, two things. Looking at it, putting on my reader hat, uh, I've always enjoyed series. If I really like a series, it's like, okay, the next. Um, and I, I, and it's, neat to know that you're you're doing that to a reader if you get readers like when oh i finished your latest book last night when's the next one coming out it's going to take me from some months here but the other thing that is nice is that you do have some solid ground under your feet it got, does give you a little bit of a head start that you sort of know your character where she is at the beginning of the the book you don't necessarily know how it's going to end up but I mean, you have some pieces you can start to play with. You don't have to invent it all from scratch. For me, the challenge is, is uh, that I have to break out of that. Uh, one of the things that I, I, everyone keeps asking, what do you do to keep a series fresh? And it's like, well, I invent new things to keep myself from being bored. Because if they were just doing the same things, I like to take my, my main character and insert her into it's kind of like, like world building within the world I've already created of her small town. I then create different things like a Halloween festival or um, a visiting Shakespearean production or uh, a, a, a designer show house with a Christmas theme. I, I usually either explore a different aspect of life in that small town, like the rivalry between the churches or the Little League or Little League equivalent. I didn't actually kill off a Little League coach. That would be really a bad idea. I invented my own Little League equivalent. Or I, I bring some newcomers into that city. So I have the, the fun of inventing new stuff, but it's within a comfortable framework that you know gives me a place to launch from. So that combination of the new elements and then seeing what my, my characters do in new situations it's a nice balance for me. Great. Can I just add? It, it's it's interesting that um, for me when I'm when I'm writing, it's so much easier not to have to deal with characters already established because <coughs> if I want to have somebody who is going to grow in a certain way or face some certain trauma or or whatever. If they're a blank slate, I can make them do whatever I want them to do. Whereas having to be 
already pigeonholed with, with the past experiences. I have written um, a second story with the same characters once before, but it was with a sheriff character, so it made it felt like more made more sense. And I also I like. I mean, I, one of the things that I like to do for palate cleansing, as as Tara calls it, I like to write short stories that are a lot different from the kind of thing that I write in my books. My short stories mm -hmm. often tend to be darker than my my books because. I, I mean, I, I read all over the map and I don't necessarily read as cozy as people perceive me to be. And, but I, I, can't, I can only get away with so dark in the books. Mm -hmm. So I will write some pretty dark short stories. I once had a, an experience that I was reading a short story to the, the writing group I was in at the time, which is not the one I'm in now with Tara's husband. And I could tell that I was reading this story and I could tell the moment when they all realized, because I hadn't told them in advance that this was not a funny story. I could tell the moment when they sort of all figured out, oh, she's not trying to be funny. We don't have to try to laugh at stuff that isn't striking us as very funny. It was a fairly dark story, but I hadn't given them a heads up and they were really trying so hard to find it funny. Okay. But, I, but, you, but I can do dark in a story you know. Yeah. You guys are, you, you're, you're having fun jumping into all of my future questions. Sorry. So, no, it's fine. It's, it's great. It's interactive. It works, but I'm like, oh, I'm going to ask this question next. No, I've got to switch it again. But um, so I'm actually, I'm going to go with what Donna last said. And that's the question of, do each of you dabble in the other methods of fiction storytelling? And you guys have all look like you you have at least in the past um some of you in the current time so i'm gonna start that one with barb sorry what was the question the question is do you dabble in the other type so you're the short story writer do you uh, you said in the beginning you wrote novels would you um, would you do novels or standalones um not recently i i have that 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 one novel that i completed is in a drawer when I um, got laid off from my job 10 years ago now, I, I took a few months and I revised it and, and I was pretty happy with it, but it was like one, one revision away from being submittable. Um, Donna read it and she said, send it out now, but I'm like, no. And it, it's still one revision away from being submittable because I don't really, I have so little time and I, when I do have time to write, I wanna do what I wanna do and that's not it. Maybe She's actually I, afraid it will be a She's afraid it will be the success I warn her it would be, and then she'll be <laughs> she'll be pressured into writing a sequel, and she won't want to do that because she doesn't have the time. So sure, okay, that's yeah. good. <laughs> Great. Um, so Donna, how about you? You've again addressed this as well. Um, whether you, yeah, uh, I mean, I've actually right. ventured into palate cleansing in terms of writing what I didn't know would be a series. Uh, I I wrote a four book shorter series and, uh, and every, it's weird. I have this gut punch, this, this knee jerk reaction. Whenever I see an announcement of an interesting looking anthology coming out, I have this, oh, why didn't they ask me to do a story? And then I say, because you don't have time to do a story right now, you doofus. But I do like it when someone, you know, ropes me into doing a story occasionally because it's usually something very different from, from my novels. I'm not sure that I would ever write a standalone. Um, I, I, if I wrote a standalone, it would be in danger of mutating into the first of a series. I know a lot of writers who have written things that turned into the first of a series. I think the most dramatic one, uh, Steve Hamilton, his first book ever, he did not see it as a series. And I, it, it, I think it's a brilliant example of how you can take a book that was not intended to be a series and find some way, I mean, and the, the reason for sleuthing in that book was so personal to his character's biography. Uh, and he turned it into a series and he found ways for that character to continue sleuthing. But I mean, I even have trouble, I have, have three short story characters, one that I've written two stories about and the other two I've written one each that I could see writing a book about that character if I had time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there, I, I fully intend to write 
about one or another, if not all of them, when I've got more time. So I, I tend to like, I if I like a character enough to write within their perspective, I'm, or a world enough to write within it, I'm kind of tempted to go back to it. Let's play there some more. Yeah. And uh, talking about that, Donna, you've got two comments in the, the chat uh, of people who want more Turing or, or love Turing. So Mark uh, yes. Yeah, Turing yeah. Hopper, my series featuring an artificial intelligence. Yep. And, and I did not stop writing that. They stopped buying the books. <laughs> and yeah. and if, uh, I, if my, my current publisher ever... <coughs> if my current publisher ever stops keeping me busy with two books a year, I might have time to do another Turing book. Yep. We shall see. All right. And Tara, you've also addressed this a little bit as well, that, that you do write short stories. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't, I was sitting here trying to think about it, though. I don't know that I've ever written anything with like recurring characters. Like, I don't, I don't think I've ever done that. Although people have asked me before, like with my, I think both my books now, you know, is this, is, is there going to be a sequel? Because I tend to end on notes where, you know, it's not completely resolved everything. So you can kind of see where maybe something could happen. Um, and then I just recently wrote a short story that one of the, like my beta readers read and was like, you should make this into a series, you know, because I love this character. And I was like, oh, no. So, but I, I don't think I've ever done that. But yeah, definitely, definitely short fiction, but haven't gotten the series. Yeah. Don't you love it when you write something and it feels like you burned the character and his or her entire world down to ashes and someone says, so is there another? <laughs> yeah. you know, no, yeah. they're dead. You know, he, he was <laughs> revealed exactly as a serial happened. killer and was tried and executed at the end of the book. Where's the sequel there? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody once asked me if I was going to have a sequel to one of my stories and I'm like, well, she's dead. So... <laughs> Yeah. No. We no longer scorn the woo-woo elements in mystery. We, we, we accept the, the occasional undead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Arthur, it didn't work for Arthur Conan Doyle when he tried to kill off Sherlock, yeah. so he still had to do it. Um, I'm going to go to a question from the audience real quick for, this is addressed mostly to Tara, which is, uh, Druanne asks, when writing a standalone, do you tend to stick with the same genre? So, um, I mean, I've written two books now, so I really have much of a legacy here, but uh, yes, I have stuck with the same genre of, um, I guess, domestic suspense is what I, I write. Um, and I have found that in the publishing industry, they strongly suggest that you stay with the same brand um, because they like to, like, if you find readers that you like, they like you to kind of stick with those readers and um, and sort of write the same thing, which is good for me because I actually really like writing dom domestic suspense. Um, if I was ever going to sort of move out of a genre and move into another one, I'd probably go darker, like Donna was talking about, um, because I'm very, like, I love horror. So I think if I was going to be a different kind of writer, I'd probably go the horror route. But to a certain extent, you have a brand. Um, and I remember at one point, I, I don't think it would embarrass him now that he's reasonably successful here, but at one point early in, when his first book was about to come out, another local writer, Ed Amar, gave me a manuscript of his book and asked me if I would possibly blurb it. And I got back to him and said, Ed, I love it, but you don't want my blurb on your book. Your blurb, my, my name will scare your readers away mm -hmm. and lure in people who won't like your book. We're so different. And, and I think that's when you, when you see a, a Donna Andrews name on the book, you're not expecting a serial killer. Mm -hmm. You're not expecting gore. Right. And, and it's, it's, I mean, I literally, was, when I was working on the Turing book with my agent, we were actually considering whether, to, whether I should put it out under a pseudonym, whether it would end up being too different from my existing books. And we left it up to the editor who decided my name would work, but yeah. Interesting. Which is kind of strange if you think about the fact that readers don't just read one genre, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I read 
every, like I read so many different kinds of things. Um, and so it, it is a strange, there's a weird tension there between like what the publishing industry kind of wants to pigeonhole you as, and then the fact that readers read a whole bunch of different things. But, but at a certain <laughs> point, if you reach visibility, you become a brand name. Yeah. I mean, if I say, I feel I'm in the mood to read a Stephen King, it's different from I'm in the mood to read an Agatha Christie. Yeah. And, and you become a shorthand for yourself. But sometimes you'll have publishers who say, series A has ended. We want to buy series B from you. They're both cozies, but we want you to have a new name for series B. And it's like, why? My readers know me. <coughs> Don't you want them to no, find there, there's, No, there's a very practical bookshop. It, it's, it's to totally break you out of the chains of the, of the selling numbers. Uh, it's not that, I mean, you're, you can figure out ways to get your reader to find you, but if your book only sold X copies last time in a store, they're not going to, uh, they're not going to order two X copies of your new book, but they might order two X copies of, of, of a, a well-reviewed book. Are you trying book to fool the bookstores? I mean, that, that doesn't you're have very much to me. You're trying to fool the computers. I mean, literally they, there are, are there are algorithms that they use to stock their stores. Mm -hmm. And I, there, there's a famous story of a writer, a writer I love, whose name was Megan Lindholm. She wrote in, in fantasy. And she, her sales had plateaued. They were decent, but they weren't rising. And she started over with a new name. And first time out of the box, they got the right kind of blurbs and, and backing. And her first book under her new name of Robin something, Robin, uh, and I'm blanking. It's, it's a know. fantasy novel. Her new book under the new name hit the New York Times bestseller list because she broke away from the chains of her, you know, they say, this is going on your permanent record. Mm -hmm. It does it to the bookstores that care about those things. Yeah. I, I agree with Barb though. I think it, it sometimes feels like yes. you're trying to pull the bookstores and I'm like, they... It, it, and a lot of times it'll say this person writing is that person's. It's like, yeah. they're not mystery authors, obviously, who can follow clues. But so uh, another good question from Paula. Um, she asked, um, do you think a series also allows your character to grow Donna? Um, but I'm actually going to throw that out to all of you guys. Um, and then that's going to lead after that. I'm going to lead into the idea of what the the pros and cons are for your um, your genre. Um, like, are there certain things that you think work better um, in your different genre? But uh, so let's start with that question of character growth. Donna, do you think the series lets your characters grow? Yes, but unless you're planning on a very short series, you have to be careful to make the growth to not to grow with them too fast. Uh, it, it's, I mean, in other words, if you're having a love story, it's gotta be a moonlighting season one story, not a Romeo and Juliet story. Um, I, at one point, one of the things that several people criticized me for in the first book was that my character was too wishy-washy and never said no to her mother. And I actually realized, you know, that's true. But so over the course of the next, I think about 10 books, she gradually got a little more independent of her mother until I, I worked my way up to a scene where mother would say, oh, Megan, I, okay, that's wonderful. And next you need to, no, mother, but no, but Meg, if only you, no. And she had to say no about five or six times before her mother took it. But I worked my way up to that. And, and ironically, in the book that I'm working on now, the book that, I, that I'm waiting to hear from my editor on, Meg actually does her best to avoid doing the exact thing she did in the first book, which is work like a dog on someone else's wedding. Yeah. She's just dumping it back on mother because mother will get someone to do it. Yeah. But I mean, it, but yeah, you have to, uh, I, I, one of the things that if you like series and you plan to have a series, one of the things you can do is plan for a, a longer term arc. My character met, eventually married and had, twins with the Mr. Wright, but it took about, I don't think they got married until like a dozen books into the series. Mm -hmm. So, and if I had any, if I had it to do over again, you're like, 
Would you do anything differently if you started your series over? Yes. I'd make every single character as much younger as possible. Because I'm starting to get turned. Well, wait a minute. Isn't Spike getting a little long in the tooth for even for a small dog? Yes, Spike is Spike should have died 10 books ago, 20 books ago. I'm not killing him off. I'm Peter Panning him to steal. Mm -hmm. And the same yeah. thing with Meg's grandfather, who has been in his mid-90s for 10 years now. It's the kind of world, it's not, my world is not an uber-realistic world. I can get away with that. So. I, I know sometimes also with series, um, people don't understand that while it's been a year that you've been waiting for this book, in the character's life, it's only been a couple of months. And I think people will get frustrated when they don't see growth not recognizing that, hey, they only went through that six months ago, not six years ago. But Sue Grafton never left the 80s. Yep. Worked for her. Yeah. Tara, how about you? How, how do you feel there is with uh, character growth with a standalone? Um, I mean, I think Donna hit it on the head there. But it's like, it's just all about what, what you're trying to write. And and what the arc is. So it just depends on how far you stretch that arc. If you're writing a, a short story that it might be really, I don't know, my metaphors, but you know, <laughs> so like with the standalone, you definitely want to, I don't know, I, I want to make sure that that character arc goes to the end. Um, it doesn't always have to resolve everything, but I think that people expect certain things from a standalone versus a series or a trilogy or a short fiction. Um, there's different kinds of expectations, not to say that they can't be broken, um, but in a standalone, you, you, I think readers expect there to be some resolution of the mystery or you know, whatever the um, crime or whatever it is that the setup is. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't that's, that's kind of where I'm going with that. No, that makes sense. And Barb, how about in short stories with character growth? Is it harder to do? Um, I think it depends on how many words you have. I, I was thinking that the stories I have out this year, I have two pretty short ones, one flash and one 11, 1200 words. So just beyond flash. And there really isn't any room to do growth there. I mean, maybe somebody more talented than me could get some growth in there, but, but I can't. But if, if you know, within 5,000 words, you know, 10 pages, 20 pages, you could get some growth in there. You're not gonna, I mean, I, I think it's important to, what you're usually looking for is you want the character to have some sort of um, past trauma or past wound that whatever happens in the story is going to affect them so that by the time they get to the end of the story, they will have changed somewhat or, or seen the light or, or something so that there will be some sort of growth. It doesn't have to be, a major life transformation, but a shift in perspective. Oh, I, I like that description That's, um, of having the, the character growth basically start before the short story starts then. So it's pretty neat. So um, one of the things I've noticed about, I, I used to, for many years, I ran a, an open writing group out of the local, first out of the local bookstore. And then when that local bookstore closed out of the local library, and one of the things I noticed that's different from a novel and a short story in terms of growth, in terms of a lot of things, for me, it's okay in a short story if it leaves the reader wanting to know more about those characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at, some at some point during almost every week, or sorry, every month, we would have someone say, I want to know more about these characters. And sometimes I would have to step in and say, so do I. It's perfect the way it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes part of what you take away from a short story is that you love this short story. You love what happens. You want more. But eating more would be like, it's that first potato chip is wonderful. Mm -hmm. But if you eat the whole bag, it's not the same thing. And yeah. sometimes what's great about a short story is if it totally satisfies the structure, the, you know, in one way, it totally satisfies and yet at the same time leaves you wanting more about this situation, these characters, this story, because it's, I mean, it's not like a book where you tell a whole saga, you're just mm. taking a piece of people's lives. And I love it when I either read a short story or manage to accomplish a short story that I feel does that. 
<coughs> that people are going to say, I want to know more about these characters. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, that's it. That you've got them hooked. You've got them interested. So that's I mean, always sometimes thing. wanting more is exactly the reaction you want to provoke. Mm -hmm. So, um, so one of the questions I had asked the authors is, um, what are the, and we've discussed a little bit here with character growth, just, but, but what are the inherent, inherent weaknesses and, and strengths of telling a story in the form that you have chosen, either standalone series or short story? Um, and I am going to ask, I'm going to start that with Tara. What are your, your pros and cons, basically, your weaknesses and your strengths of standalones? Yeah, so I feel like I've talked about some of these um, already, but I think the challenge is that as a writer, um, from a writer standpoint with a standalone, is that you are creating everything from scratch every time. Um, and so you have to invent a world and you have to invent characters and then you also have to have a plot and, you know, make things happen. So um, doing all of that can be really overwhelming and challenging every time. And I, I think, I mean, I'm writing my third one now. I've just started and I feel like it's like I've not learned anything from writing two other ones. Um, but the pros, again, what I've said before is that like, you are starting new and so you make the characters do whatever you want and like there's no history there like a reader isn't going to tell you well in book three she had blue eyes and now she's got green eyes like what is wrong with you um and so you have the freedom I think more of not having that legacy of of what happened before and you know trying to make sure that that's um coherent and co cohesive throughout so yeah, that makes sense. And Barb, how about you? I have heard people say in the past that I don't read short stories because I like to be able to sink into a book and just get to know them. And, and short stories aren't satisfying that way. And I always say that you're not reading the right short stories because you can find short stories that give you everything you want out of a novel it's just shorter and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, somebody once said to me, I, I'd much rather have a really good date than a really bad long marriage. Um, and the dog is really annoying tonight. I'm sorry. Maybe somebody else could talk. Hi, sweetie. Okay, okay. I will talk about the, the, the alternate challenge of writing a series one of the things you have to do if you've got a series is you've got to introduce everybody. I mean, I, I maybe everybody else doesn't do that. I mean, I've seen writers who are smart enough to like, they bring on new characters for this week, this book's mystery, and then they kill enough of them off that they've got a, a, an, an open stage for the next book. My characters tend to hang around and join the cast. And, and, and I like that because it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of what the books are about is, you know, family relationship, town stuff. But one of the things I have to go through that I always get dinged at by my editor is, is like, we need more background on who so-and-so is. And you have to become, if you're writing a series, you have to become a past master at the art of slipping those necessary bits of backstory in without, you know, you cannot stop and write a paragraph about, the relationship between this character and your main character in the past mm -hmm. 10 books. You've got to find a, 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 a nuanced, you know, different for every book. You can't get away with the, you know, Kinsey Milhelm, there was the, the description of the little black dress that appeared every time. You can't really get away with that too much. You need to have come up with a new way of expressing the core about this character or pinning the, the eccentricities or the interests or the, the, the passions. And you have to weave that in along with the plot. And you have to do it in a way that doesn't bore the people who have already read 29 of your books. Mm. And yet is not incomprehensible to the people who pick this one up for the first time. That's one of the biggest challenges is giving both the newbies and the, the long-term readers both a satisfactory experience. So I spend a lot of time working worrying about that actually. Yeah, I've, I have seen other people do that poorly, 
where they do it in dialogue and they're like, oh, look, it's your brother. You know your brother, right? The one that owns the computer gaming store. Mm -hmm. And people just don't normally talk like that. No. So, so Barb, do you want to come back with the uh, weaknesses and strengths of uh, short story writing? Um, um, <laughs> nope. I'm sorry, right. the dog is just really distracting me right now. I don't know what his deal is tonight. I'm the dog sorry. is very, very. He's cute, got so. zoomitis. It's it's a it's a thing that pets get. Yeah. This is not that. I don't know what his deal is. Oh, poor poor Jingle. Not even a full moon either. No. Nope. Um, so let me look at some more of the questions from the audience. Um, uh, we did hear some, uh, I did want to say to Gail, uh, Gail was talking about how no, reading no, does help no. her during COVID because she no. can entertain herself with no. uh, reading these books. And that is a nice thing about this, that we all get to to, to use our imagination and, and get to read these great books and short stories you guys do. So. Uh, wanted to do that. Um, we no. got a question. Using Bill also flashbacks. asked about using short stories, using flashbacks in short yep. stories. Yeah, and was... I would advise proceeding with great caution on that. I was once editing a short story that had, I think it was about 12 flashbacks going back and forth to five different time periods. Mm. And my head was spinning. <laughs> Uh, I talked the I talked the author out of eleven of those twelve flashbacks. I seem to recall and made more sense. But flashbacks are tough in general, and you don't have room for a lot of them in a book, uh, in a short story rather. Yeah, I'm not always that fond of it in a a full length novel. So yeah, I think it would be hard to do in a short story. Um. So, I would much rather see an author try to convey the information that would be contained in a flashback in some other way, like by interior monologue, by dialogue, by, oh my God, but don't you realize she's actually the person who, flashbacks are overused, I think. Yeah, they can be. Um, so I'm going to, I don't know in our audience if we have some writers out there that are wondering whether they should be a short story writer or a, a standalone writer or a series writer. Um, but I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on what kind of writer characteristics are best or personality characteristics are best suited to each of these forms of fiction. It could be just what you personally think makes yourself a good um, series writer. <laughs> So let's start um, with Tara for that. Um, I don't, I don't think I have good <laughs> characteristics to be a novelist. So I don't, I don't know if I um, am the best <coughs> person to defend that. But um, I, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I think no matter what you're writing, you have to sit down every day and you have to work on it and you have to do it and you have to show up. Um, and yes, I feel like it's a different animal to write a longer story than it is to write short fiction. Um, just for me, the challenge is um, not being able to see the entire story or be able to contain the entire story in my head. Um, if I'm writing something short, I can kind of see it. You know, I kind of know where it's going. I, I, I can hold it in my hands in a different way. Um, and I had to get very used to the uncomfortableness of not being able to do that when I'm writing a novel. Um, I'm sure everyone has heard this metaphor about the driving at night and, you know, only being able to see as far as your headlights on the road. And I've just found that to be so true. It's like, I really only can see a few beats ahead as to, you know, my book. And sometimes still when I'm done writing, a book I am astonished that people can sit down and read it like it's like it's a coherent story because, because to me it's just these like chunks of random things that I've put together um so I think if you can like if you can ease into that like uncomfortableness and like be okay with that then you know perhaps you can write a novel but I, I know there are other people who are totally happy just like writing a whole bunch of stuff and just seeing where it goes. And I just, I'm not, I'm like too much of a control freak for this to, to feel comfortable to me. Do I deduce from that that you don't outline or plan 
over much? I don't outline, I, I tried to outline my second novel and I wrote it and then I had to throw it all the way. So I realized I'm not really an outliner. So yeah. I think it, for those of us who are outliners or planners, I think that that it overcomes that that discomfort about not being able to hold the whole thing in your brain at one time. Because I, I especially when I was working full time and writing, uh, which I haven't done for a long time, thank goodness, because it was hard. But I like to consider my my outline or synopsis or whatever you call it. I, I consider it a door back into my book, a door back into where my head was. And, you know, I can be distracted for a week by horrible or wonderful things going on in real life, by, by being sick, by having a lot of work, whatever. But if I, when I go back and I just kind of go back to the synopsis and it, it's a door back into where I'm supposed to be when I'm working on this book. So for me, I, I, the, I think the challenge for someone who's an outliner is not to, not to be slavishly bound to it. If you consider it, uh, I mean, at one point, I remember that this was uh, back when I used to work in corporate America, we used to have these battles over the budgets. I was good at computers, so I was the one who always had to work up the departmental budget. And I remember raging at my boss, doesn't he, about our department head, like, don't you understand? It's supposed to be a guideline, not a straitjacket. And that's kind of the way I have to remind myself, just because it happens in the outline doesn't mean it has to happen in the book. If you, if you figure out, I mean, if I figure out something that's better than what I have in my synopsis, I roll with it. But then I go back and, okay, and how does that make my outline come out? <coughs> so that discomfort of, I may not know what's ahead of me outside of the headlights at any given moment, but I know where I, you know, when, if it, if it suddenly turned on and I, it was light and I could see my deadline, I know where I'm going. Uh, I don't always get there by the route I plan, but I rarely start a book with having at least a vision of how I want it to end. So. Do you, do you guys think that being a, a plotter or an outliner is, is better suited to a certain of these three things of being like, does it, does it help you're an outliner and you write a series? Is it easier to be a, a pantser or, or a discovery writer and write short stories? Do you think that lends itself to, to that genre or not genre, but writing style? Um, no, Jared, no I, think, I, think I think it's more that works for you. Yeah. I think, it's, it, I mean, I know, I know standalone suspense writers who outline every single detail before they ever write a word. Mm -hmm. It does not work for me, or at least it didn't the time I tried it, but, um, in the, I mean, on the opposite, like, so I, I really don't I think it's just whatever works for the person. I was talking to a writer who was on a fierce, fierce deadline and had a day job and her day job was kicking her butt. And she, she was fret, venting to me about, oh my God, how can I possibly do this? And I said, well, you know what works for me? I can always write faster if I'm writing to an outline. And she wrote an outline and she, she you know, she said she tried because she was normally just a, a pantser. And she called me back a few days later and said, I hate you. What do I do now? And she said, I've written an outline. It's a fabulous outline. It would be a fabulous book. And now I feel absolutely no motivation to write it. It's like I already did it by doing the outline. I said, great. Mm -hmm. Your new challenge is to come up with something better. Start writing and at every, you know, come up with something better than what's in that outline. Beat the outline at every turn. Hmm. I think she managed to work with that. But, you know, if you haven't outlined, try it. If it doesn't, if, if you find it, it hampers you, don't make yourself do that. Right. You know, a, a lot of people say, well, I have to write an outline for my publisher. Yeah, but not till you turn the book in. Mm -hmm. You can write a synopsis a lot more easily when you've already written a book. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten less, I've gotten less, fab, less fanatical about outlining. I, I hit a high point of a 30 page outline for a 300 page book. But I don't outline that much anymore, and I'm not sure whether it's that I'm lazy or whether I've learned to do it well enough that I have a certain degree of confidence that if I start out with a good beginning and have a nice ending that I can work toward, I think I have a lot more confidence than I used to that I can get there. Mm -hmm. And I worry less when I go off course. 
I have one client who um, used to be a, almost completely a pantser, and now she outlines a lot. And it's because she got tired of getting um, edits back of her manuscripts going, but why did this happen? But why did that happen? But I don't understand. Why did this happen? And then she'd have to figure out why it happened and then do a complete revision. So now she gets that, but she gets those questions a lot less from me and it makes the revision process easier for her. She, she, she doesn't outline every little thing, but she puts thought ahead of time into the big questions of what are the big plot points going to be and why is that going to happen? Um, and, and that would be a recommendation to anyone, no matter, no matter if you're a pantser or a plotter, think about the big questions in advance. It'll make it easier. <laughs> And remember the whole thing in, in Bird by Bird about give yourself permission to write a shitty first draft? I consider my outlines my shitty first draft. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only are they rotten, but they're way too short. They're lazy. All I have to do is tell what I'm going to write. I don't actually have to write it. Yeah. Where's the pressure? But I mean, for me, it's, it's a comfort thing to know that I've got, it, it's kind of like, I know I have a map. Some people get out there with only an internal compass. And I like to have my map. I no longer need to mark in, in, I no longer need to take a magic marker and do every single turn I'm going to do on that map. But I like having it there. So uh, yeah. Heather um, asked a good question a screen or two ago. Yep, she said, if you, were, that. Yeah, if you were going to start writing a series. Um. Well, she, she, what she asked was, did you find that, did I miss, oh, there, okay, she, she asked two questions, all right. Um, yeah. Yes, if you do hope to have a series, but don't know if it will be one, is there anything you should be sure to do in book one? Thank you, Don. I did miss that question from her. Yeah, and I, I think that actually isn't a question that's stupid for standalones and short stories, but I think I, the one thing I did that was smart when I first started writing my series, my first series, I put in a lot of stuff that I thought would be fun to play with if the series took. I didn't do that much with some of the elements. I had the, the large family. I had my, my heroine's father being a doctor. Uh, I had the brother being kind of a, a clueless doofus. I mean, I didn't do as much as I could have with some of the stuff. I. It's kind of like I... I I was, I was like the, 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 the Boy Scout and was prepared for everything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't use everything I brought in that first book, but they were there and they were, and, and they were, it gave me a lot of, of places to go in, back into my world later. Uh, I didn't, in other words, I didn't create a lot of established relationships. I had some possibilities of relationships. Uh, so I think giving yourself a lot of directions to go and a lot of pieces to play with, a lot of fun things is always good when you're starting a series. And it's probably not a stupid thing to do when you're starting a series or a, short, or a standalone or a short story is, you know, you'll narrow it down sooner or later, but start with a really big canvas with a lot of, a lot of toys to play with. And then you see which ones fit into what you're doing. That said, Margaret Marin and her big series, her main character had, what, 11 brothers or something like that? And she said later on in the series, she wished she had made a smaller family. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That happens. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not talking about 11 brothers, no. But <coughs> but you don't want to make your, your character an only child and then find out that siblings would be useful for dragging her into mysteries. And you don't want to give her a job that you know a lot about, but you find boring, because then do you really want to write any mysteries about your boring job kind of thing? Just put in a lot of things that you would have fun playing with. And then give yourself the freedom to play with them. And make sure to make your characters younger so that you don't have to have the... So uh, you don't have to Peter Pan them, yes. Don't have to Peter Pan them, I mean, yeah. You know, you, I, I never expected to be writing the same series 20 years later. Mm -hmm. but I'm still enjoying it. And the readers still seem to still be enjoying it partly because they're partly because it's not really the same series. She's in a different situation and doing different things, but I'd have made them younger. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
do either. Um, one other question for Donna and Tara was, um, do you find that the short stories that you write send readers to your longer work? And I know Heather had said that Donna writes darker shorts, but Donna's also written short stories for Meg, Meg Langslow. So, yeah. so do you guys find, Tara, I'll start with you, Tara, but uh, have you found that your short stories lead people to your novels? Um, I don't have any evidence of that. Mm -hmm. I, like, I couldn't tell you a story, like, you know, something that, that I don't know. I, I don't, I honestly don't know. Sorry, that's a boring answer, but I would hope so, but I, yeah. I, I don't know. My only evidence of that is my own behavior as a reader, which is that I can think of three times right off the top of my head when I've read a short story by someone in an anthology and gone out and got a book by them because I liked what they were you know, I liked the way they wrote or what the world they were writing in or whatever. So at least for some readers, it does work. Yeah. And I have been, I write humorous short stories and dark short stories. So for example, my short story in the Joni Mitchell anthology, The Beat of Black Wings, probably won't, won't if anyone who gets sent to my books from that short story will probably be looking for something they're not going to find. <laughs> but but in the, the monkey business, Marx Brothers anthologies that came out this year, my short story isn't about any of my characters in my series. But if you like that, you'd probably like my books. It's, a, you know. Yep. Um, and I'll, I will ask Barb a, a related question. It's just Barb, do you think when someone, do you think people get to know you as a, from one short story and then find your other ones? And of course, you've got the collection of short stories that you have published. Do you think your shorts lead people to to reading, like, are they the next Barb Hoffman as soon as it comes out? God, I hope so. Um, I, <laughs> I I don't know about as soon as it comes out, but I mean, I have just recently I have seen two different people post reviews of saying, I "Really love this short story." I'm going to Amazon to see what else she has, and I was like, "Yay!" So, um, so yeah, great. Somebody anecdotal evidence that. only, but anecdotal evidence works. Yeah. I mean, somebody told me last year that I have a brand, and I'm not exactly sure what that brand is, but it's nice to know I have it. So there you go. <laughs> I think for a while it was revenge, but uh, that was in a lot of your stories. But amusing revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to say if any readers um, or listeners, sorry, have any other questions, I I think I've hit most Kathy, of there's them. some questions in that um, q and The Q&A thing. Yeah. yeah, I never look at the Q&A. Thank you for that. Yes. All right. Ah, beautiful. Lots of questions and answers. Okay, so um, we're going to, we'll do these. And then after that, I'm going to ask the authors um, what they've got um, coming. So um, I will ask, have any from Lynn Jordan, have any of the authors co-written anything that was not an anthology? And if so, how did you collaborate collaborate their efforts? So I will start with you, Tara. Um, I think this is the answer to this question. I wrote co-wrote a story with my husband Art um, for the Beat of Black Wings anthology that Donna mentioned, um, and uh, we wrote it as um, letters back and forth so that. We didn't have to actually collaborate on sentences. Um, that's probably the only reason why we aren't divorced right now, because it was even so kind of a painful process um, because we write very differently and not only style-wise, but speed-wise. Like I'm a much faster writer than art. So like I would get my letter done and send it to him. And then like two weeks later, I'd be like, um, hi, uh, have you written it yet? <laughs> What's going on? I don't like getting up to deadlines. So we had um, this interesting process to, to write together. Um, but uh, it was fun. And um, I don't know that I would do that often at all, because not only just with art, but with anyone, just because it's a really hard process. I'm curious to see if any of you have done it. It's I, I find it, I find it not a great thing to do it, it can be challenging the only time i can remember having collaborated on someone with someone was weirdly um mwa was doing some anniversary things and the criminal element wanted 
one of the things they thought of, they wanted to get two very different writers to work together on a short story. And I came up with an idea where I would, where in my, my Meg's fictional world uh, would be, uh, I, I looked around to see who was as different from me as possible. And John Gilstrap, who writes thrillers, who's in, he's in the writing group with, uh, with, with Art, Tara's husband and me and Ellen Crosby and Art, Alan Orloff. And I came up with an idea for a story where one of the big tough mercenaries from John's thriller series came and paid a visit to the small Southern town that my series takes place in. And it was, it was published in the criminal element. I think it's still available there. And John's, uh, the, the audiobook reader who does John's audiobooks decided to do an audio version of it just kind of as a, as a showpiece. So you can find uh, on a uh, look on the criminal element. I think it was called an unexpected guest or an uninvited guest. But it turned out really funny because although John writes very tough, very, you know, I mean, they are tough thrillers, but they are thrillers with a heart. And we both have senses of humor. So we were kind of playing off the humorous contrast between where we have this mercenary whose arms won't even go flat by his sides because he's so muscular and who's got more concealed weapons than he can count and then inserting him in the middle of a tea party at the church. And it was fun mm -hmm. uh, and it was successful and it worked rather well. But I think that was just because we knew we were doing it for a special project and we both had limited time that we could spend on it and we just got it done. Uh, and it was an interesting process. Um, other than that, I can't think of any time uh, at the time I began writing my series, a friend that would that did some brainstorming with me said, maybe we should write that together. It didn't take me more than about two seconds to think, no. Yeah. I I it's a solid it's it's a solitary, uh, not a vice, a solitary occupation, but it does work best solitary for most of us, I think. Barb, how about you? Have you uh, co-written anything that was not in the anthology? Nope. Okay. No. <laughs> then he I reads will, dialogue uh, to scout sometimes. Yeah. So I will do your next, uh, I'll, I'll start with Barb then for the next question. Um, do the authors write more than one story at, or book at the same time? Um, or do you just stay focused on one current work at a time? I'm usually one at a time. Um, th there have been instances where I'll be writing something and I'll get stuck. So I'll say, okay, I only have two weeks to write this month or you know this year. Um, and I don't wanna just be stuck on this for a week. So I'll give it three days. And if it's not going anywhere, I'll set it aside and I'll work on something else and I'll come back to it. But that's unusual. Um, I, I'm, I'm only, I don't write, um, there are some people who can go to their day jobs and then they come home and write, but I, I just, edit all the time and I only have dedicated time for writing mm -hmm. so but what I'll do is if it's a non-writing month and I have an idea for a story I'll just send myself an email and it might be a very detailed email so you consider that part of writing because when I do get writing time I'll go through the emails and be like "Ooh, that one I can write that one now so I, I I'm sort of I, the, the actual typing of the story one at a time usually but thinking process can happen at any time. Okay, that makes sense. Tara? Um, when I'm working on a like a full-length book project, I can okay. only no. focus on that. No. Um, I have only dedicated, I only have a little limited amount of time because I also have a day job editing um, and a son and other responsibilities. So I really have very, very, very limited time to write and need to have my brain focused on like a longer piece. So I, when I was writing shorter fiction, I could sometimes sort of flip between two or three different things. In fact, when I was writing my full length short story collection, I had to do that because I had to trick, like if I was writing a short story and I kind of got to a spot where I didn't know what to do, 
um, the, you know, it's the grass is greener on the other side kind of thing. I was like, oh, that other idea looks so much better. And then I'd go to that one and write that one for a while and kind of, you know, trick myself into going back and forth between them. Um, but for the book, I just, I need to get, get it in my head. So I need to stick with it. Donna? I prefer working on one thing at a time. Although I've been known to bounce into something else if I need a palate cleanser. But, um, but life doesn't usually let you do that. I mean, if you're doing a series, and I lately have been doing two books a year, I'm working on one. And I want to be focusing on one and not thinking about anything but that one. But invariably, the book before that will be going through copy edits. And I have to go back and rethink. I have to go back and answer the copy editor's questions, which may get into plotting, you know, uh, and on page so-and-so, he says this, and yet on page so-and-so. And then the book before that is the one I'm out and talking to people about. You know, if I'm, I'm doing an event, I'm talking about the book that's actually just been published. And so I, I knock off the copy edits, and I go into an event and talk about the book that's published, and maybe a little bit about the book that's about to be published. And I'm back on the book that I'm writing, and then my editor will pop and want an outline for the, you know, I'm going to talk to marketing and I need to give the cover people instructions. So we need a, a little bit about the next book. And yeah. so I like to focus on one and to silo it, but life doesn't usually let you do that. And that's without coming up with, oh, will you write a short story for this? Ooh, this anthology I want to try to try to be in this as a deadline. So, yeah. but Fortunately, since unlike uh, Barb and Tara, I'm not, I don't have an editing job that, that eats up a lot of my time. I can actually moonlight from my writing by working on another kind of writing. If I've done my quota for the day, I might mm. like, okay, put it all aside and work on a short story idea. But it's not the optimal thing. All right, I'm going to get to, I'll try to get to some more of these questions, and I apologize for missing that little section of, of uh, Zoom there, um, but I want to make sure that the writers get a chance to talk about what they are working on now or what they have upcoming to be published. Um, I will start with Barb on that. Um, well, the next two things that I have coming out, supposedly both of them before the end of the year, is a story called um, Go Big or Go Home. And this is going to be in the next Malice Domestic Anthology. Anybody who um, is Facebook friends with me will know that I hate, hate, hate unsolicited advice. So in this story, I took someone and I had her suffer through lots of unsolicited advice. And, well, you'll just have to read and see what happens. It's fun. Um, and then the second story is called Beauty and the Biatch. And uh, there's, um, it's about three girls in high school and one is in the middle and she has her best friend here and she has her new best friend here and they don't like each other. Um, and who is the beauty and who is the biatch? You have to read it to find out. Great. All right, and I know you've got lots and lots of things still coming. You, you, you are a machine with short stories, so. Um. I just had a lot of things out in a short period of time. I, I've written them over a long time. Yes. Yeah. Um, Tara? Um, so I have a short story that's been, just been accepted for Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, which I actually initially tried to write for one of the Chessie cha chapter anthologies. Um, the, I think it was the magic one. And then it just, it was not working at all in terms of magic. It was like, I was trying to stretch it so hard to make it fit that. So I put it aside and then I came back to it and reworked it and submitted it there and they just accepted it. So it'll probably be out in like five years. <laughs> um, Alfred Hitchcock? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're that slow. Yeah, they're slow. Not that slow, but they're slow. Um, and then I was talking earlier about collaborating on a story with art and it, we actually wrote another one um and so we're kind of we got a tentative acceptance for that story as well but um nothing final yet so hopefully you'll be seeing that at some point soon um and then i am working on my third standalone domestic -y suspense novel <coughs> which all of my books are very um 
uh, setting, like atmospheric setting. So it will be the same and probably bad things have happened in the past that are now coming back to haunt the people in the present. So, but I'm in the midst of figuring that all out. So wish me luck. Yeah, good luck. Donna? Let's see, this year I've had two books come out. Uh, uh, Murder Most Foul, it takes place around a production of Macbeth. And The Twelve Jays of Christmas is a, a Christmas novel that features a, an evil, uh, irascible wildlife artist who manages to tick everybody off and then one of them murders him. Uh, that just came out last month. Uh, I also have a short story out in Monkey Business, which is an anthology from Untreed Reads where every story was inspired by one of the Marx Brothers movies. <coughs> I think Barb has a short story in that too. And um, I have a short story called Something Dark and Dangerous that will be coming out in the next Chesapeake Crimes, which is coming out uh, in the spring, right? And I'm working, I, I have turned in the manuscript and I'm waiting to hear from my editor about a, the, the uh, literary work that is traveling under the name of Round Up the Usual Peacocks. Uh, I'm going back to Peacocks, not because I'm ending the series, but because this is having a wedding theme around it. Although it's actually got more true crime than wedding stuff because my interests have changed over the years. And I have gotten sign off from my editor on the title and the rough concept for next year's Christmas book which will be called Dashing Through the Snowbirds. And that's what I'm up to. Right. Um, I have posted everyone's websites um, up on the, on, in the chat, um, including the Chessie Chapters um, website and the National Sisters in Crime. Uh, real quick for me, I also have a story coming out in the Chessie Crimes um, anthology, Magic is Murder, called Courting Disaster. It's about Merlin. Um, and I've got a book coming out before the end of the year in The Big Fang, which is a uh, Harborview, Maine anthology, and that's called Follow Your Nose. Um, so that is it. Well, I've got more coming up next year, but let me get back to everybody's questions. Um, Leanne Hoffman asked, how much do you draw on your own life for your stories? Um, I'll start with Donna for that. Well, I don't see nearly as many dead bodies as Meg does, actually. Um, I'm often inspired by not so much real life stuff as stuff that interests me in real life, which is different. Um, for example, the book, the manuscript I just turned in, Meg is investigating a couple of cold cases because one of her nephews has started a true crime podcast. And this grew out of the fact that one of the things I've been amusing myself with during the quarantine is listening to true crime podcasts. Uh, that's my new, my new fix. Uh, and I'm, and, and in, for example, uh, in Murder Most Foul, I'm loosely inspired by having worked backstage at a production of Macbeth in college. And I remember the shenanigans. So you take stuff that happened in your real life and you turn the volume up to 11 or you take stuff that you see around you and, and do the whole, what if, you know, you see a, a dog bounding through the snow in your backyard and stop and sniff and then bound away. And you wonder what if that was a body he was sniffing at, you know, so it's not so much using stuff that really happens in your real life as stuff you run across as you beetle through the, the world. How about you, Barb? Sometimes. Um, I, I often, especially lately, I find I've been mining my past. Um, and you'll just see little bits of it in stories or something that happened will be the basis for um, a story that becomes something completely different. Um, Dear Only Etiquette was, was based on something that happened, the conversation I had with a friend um, an old friend who said something that really hurt my feelings and she didn't mean to hurt my feelings. 
Um, and I, but I, you know, I, I thought, what are you, she, she recently gotten married and I thought, what are your single friends not good enough for you anymore? So um, I wanted to write the story, but I didn't want to hurt her feelings because she didn't mean to hurt mine. So when I wrote the story, I, I, I incorporated the idea that single people weren't good enough for the bride, but it was a completely different story so that the person who said that thing to me, who I know is not on this call, um, would um, not have recognized herself. Okay. Tara? Yeah, um, same for me. Like I take little tidbits here and there and they end up hopefully completely different than whatever the origin was. Um, mm -hmm. I do like to name my characters after my friends. <laughs> like I like to throw in minor characters with my friends' names. It's fun, but yeah. All right. Uh, do you guys like to, I, I like to eavesdrop on other people and sometimes that can that can inspire. So I have uh, time for like one more question. So I'm gonna choose one from Helena, or H Helena uh, since I haven't had a question from her yet, but she's, and this is a question that I think applies to all three uh, short stories, standalones and short stories uh, and series. Um, when I open to the first page, that first sentence has to grab me and she has trouble writing an interesting one. Do you have a formula for a winning starting sentence? And I'm gonna start with, Tara for that? Um, I would say not have a formula because that would be the death of a good sentence. Um, I mean, I, I think a good sentence, first sentence has to just fit whatever the story is, the theme, whatever works for that particular piece. So I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think you can have like a formula for it. Um, I will say that one of the things that I used to see a lot when I was uh, editor of Smoke Long, when I was doing flash fiction, one of the biggest um, editorial suggestions that we gave writers was to cut the first sentence or the first paragraph or whatever, and same with the last. Um, and so I always, when I'm finished, I go back and I look at whatever I've done and I see if that's possible. And a lot of times it is, like a lot of times you're sort of um, clearing your throat and, you know, like kind of easing into a piece. And then once you're finished, go back and look and see like, do I really need that? Like, where does the story actually start? Um, and so that's, I guess that's my writing tip for, for first lines is, is that really the first line or is it a little further down on the page? Okay. Barb, how about you? Um, I think Tara's Everything, I agree with everything Tara said. I'm in a Facebook group where uh, people post um, first lines every week of, of what they're reading. Uh, the book, the group started a long time ago. It was supposed to be good first lines, but now people just post first lines. Um, and first lines, I, I think everybody's going to be different. But for me, a first line that really sets the mood and the atmosphere is going to be like, oh, I want to read that. Whereas a, a first line that has a whole lot of detail, that could get boring fast. You, you need to figure out, you need to figure, just figure out something that's going to make people want to go, oh, I want to read that. And, and since you're the writer, I would say write for what you would want to read because you're your best reader. Okay. Good advice. Donna, anything to add? No, I'm, <coughs> I kind of like to think like imagine the story of is a, a long belt and you've got you have to figure out where you cut the beginning and where you cut the end and i like to sometimes i actually write some stuff that's happening towards the beginning and figure out where the interesting place to cut in because starting at, as they as they used to say in media res right in the middle of things is a good thing and often i i often look for a moment when something that will be intriguing mm -hmm. and yet uh, for example the uh, I think the first line of uh, I think the first line of the 12 days of Christmas if I remember correctly is look out the wombats are loose again which kind of you don't know why the wombats are loose or why there are wombats there period but Wombats getting loose sounds like an interesting thing to have happen. It entertained me. 
so I thought it would entertain the reader. Another much earlier book started out with, I'm going to kill Michael's mother. Meg actually isn't going to kill her then boyfriend, now husband's mother, but she was really annoyed with her and she, was, she went on to say, I'm going to do it you know, quickly and, and, and humanely to cause a minimum of pain and suffering, but I am going to have to kill her now. And then she went on to bend about what the mother was doing that was driving her and indeed the rest of the world crazy. So, I mean, I just often look for something that will catch people's attention. The sort of line that would catch your attention. You know, have you ever been in a coffee shop or in line and you hear and suddenly something comes out of people's, someone's mouth and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm going to listen to that. I should have been listening to this conversation. That kind of line often makes a good start. Mm -hmm. But uh, it has to fit with the story. It has to I, fit I, with I, the story. I've read stories where people just throw in a really good first line and then you find out, and it was a dream, and now the rest oh, of the story yeah, is yeah. blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no. Uh, and, and, it, it, and, what, and what works for... I'm trying to find... I'm trying to remember the first line. There's a, uh, there's a book called Gun Monkeys by Victor Gishler. And it has for a sort of a semi-humorous, uh, for a semi-humorous book, it's it's something like, um, you know, as I as I, I don't, if, oh, if I can only find that because it's it's on my favorite lines of first time. It's like uh, I turn here it is I turned the Chrysler onto the Florida Turnpike with Rollo Kramer's headless body in the trunk, and all the time I'm thinking. I should have put some plastic down. That kind of lets you know what kind of a book you're in. It's, it's, we're not talking a cozy, but we're not talking deadly serious either. Uh, Great. I think you guys gave some good examples there and, and, and your techniques as well. Um, I definitely want to thank Donna Andrews, Barb Goffman, and Tara Laskowski for representing their series short stories and standalone so well. Um, thank you to the Ellen Coolidge Burke uh, branch of the Alexander thank Libraries, you. and thank you, Carolyn, for, for hosting us. And definitely thank you to all the attendees who came and participated. Again, we'd love to hear from you guys, so thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I just want to thank the authors again and for everyone attending. Such good, such great questions. <coughs> um, and so um, we'll be recording. Actually, we are recording this and we will be posting it on our YouTube site, which is currently down. So we're, it's, it's down for maintenance, but uh, hopefully in a week or so we should put it up there. So um, please check in a couple of weeks. Uh, and I just want to mention that um, Donna will be joining our mystery book club to talk about her holiday mystery. So if you're interested in, um, you know, uh, learning and more about, about that. Uh, yeah, about a month, right? Exactly. On the, on the, uh, let me just double check. Mm -hmm. I will, I will just put it in the chat real quick. And if you want to click on it and get all the information, um, it's our monthly book club. So we will be reading a couple of her holiday mysteries and, and, um, to see what what inspired her to write write the series um so thank you everyone and i just want to thank kathy again for a great year of mystery panels and all the work you've done organizing these authors and all the great themes so really really appreciate it and thank you for supporting libraries um so thank you everyone so much have a great thank evening you. all right yeah well, next time bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. bye.